We're back in the Food 52 test kitchen, and today we are going to be making soup. Specifically, we are making geda tang, which is a northern Chinese-style dumpling soup. And by dumpling, I mean something closer to German spätzle or Italian gnocchi than Asian dumpling. This is one of my favorite ways to make tomato and egg soup. It's taken me a long time to crack the code, but this is a special approach. Now, geda is a really beloved dish for a lot of home cooks and especially children. It's not a dish that you get to see very much here in the US because there aren't that many northern Chinese immigrants here yet. Geda has a m unfortunate translation. Geda means pimple or pockmarks or like, um, uh, yeah, it just means like a raised surface on your skin. It's not very pleasant. And so that's what this dumpling is named after. It's disgusting. <laughs> I will say, by the way, everyone's favorite Sichuanese dish is mapo tofu, and mapo also refers to a skin disease. So that's that for you. Yep. Uh... Okay, good. Uh, first and foremost, two ways to do it, both designed to be easy for the home kitchen in a short amount of time. We'll call one the wet version, and we'll call one the dry version. Now, I'm gonna prepare the two doughs, and then I'm gonna start building my broth. That soup is not gonna take very long at all. The wet version, in my opinion, is a little bit easier of a recipe to do last minute. And the way I really use gada in my regular day-to-day -day is I build a beautiful, delicious soup. I want a little bit more starch in there, so I'll whip something up within a couple of seconds so that I have little cute dough dumplings or little bits of starch floating inside of my soup. A little bit like, a, like alphabet soup. You know, the soup itself is delicious, but you add a little bit of cute, bouncy Q stuff inside enhances the experience. The dry version is more of a foolproof method, but the texture that you'll get is a little bit more of a dense and substantial dumpling, if that makes sense. Let's start with the wet version, which can be translated as a dough drop. In our written recipe, by the way, I'm gonna give you proportions, but know that depending on the type of flour you use and the temperature of your water, this may vary a little bit, so watch for the visual cues. Here we have a cup of AP flour, annoyingly, AP flour in the Western world is at a different gluten level to AP flour in uh, Eastern Asia, specifically in China. What you don't want to use is bread flour in the US. What you don't want to use is high gluten flour. Got it? Somewhere in between. We're going to be adding water. Water needs to come out of the tap, but it needs to be warm. Uh, it's not scalding, it's not hot. It's just slightly warm to the touch, uh, maybe at your body temperature. That goes in, and as it goes in, we're going to start mixing this. What we're building is a very wet, it's not even really a dough, it's more like a flour water mixture. Nothing like bread, nothing, a little bit close to pancakes. We're just adding this and mixing it until that flour and that water is evenly incorporated. Try to get as many of the lumps out as possible. And the visual cue here is a pancake batter, but also it should slide off your mixing utensil kind of like barely. It should cling a little bit and then drip. You want to mix it so that it's well incorporated, but you also don't want to overmix it. So it shouldn't become tacky, if that makes sense. Also, the flour is gonna take a little bit of time to absorb that water. So after you mix it to this consistency, just let it sit for maybe a little less than five minutes. Now that's the wet batter onto the dry dough. Same starting point, about a cup of flour in the bowl. And we're going to sprinkle some water onto the surface of the flour. And we're going to build natural little lumps of dough. Let's flick that in there and then start shaking it and moving it around. Flick a little bit of water in there and mix. Mix, 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 mix. Flick some more water in there, drizzle it, and keep that going. This is the one that um, you need to really look for. I think this is the one that takes a little bit more time but produces more substantial dumplings. It also is an, an annoying thing for us recipe developers because it's really hard to describe this process because there's no exact ratio. You're just drizzling water onto the surface until lumps start to appear. You see them? You start to see them, right? And if you pick them up, what I like about these dumplings is that they're really nice and delicate. They're really like, they're like little babies, dough babies. So we're looking for lumps here that are a little bit, about a quarter inch in diameter maybe. We don't want the dough to clump. So once you start to see separate little pieces like this, make sure you just shake it up before you add any more. The irregularity is beautiful and perfect here. Perfectly imperfect sizes. But as you can tell, again, no recipe. You have a little bit of a margin of error. It's quite simple to make. So now with the wet dough and the dry dough done, we can move on to the broth. 
We just made our dough. Now it's the time to make the broth. I'm gonna show it to you once because Caesar made us a delicious version at the back. So we'll do the dough drop twice. Um, once with the wet dough and once with the dry dough. What makes broth delicious, oftentimes when we make it with an animal protein or bones, is an emulsification of oils with the water and that strong punch of savoriness coming from the proteins themselves. You might be familiar with a type of bone broth called tonkotsu in Japan, which is pork bone broth, really thick. The reason why it's thick is because it's an emulsification of fat and water, and there's a bunch of calcium and collagen and all these delicious things and gelatin that bind all those things together. So you get this nice, uh, well-rounded flavor. You can approximate that with eggs too. You don't have the same amount of collagen and gelatin, obviously, but you do have some of those delicious savory proteins that I think are interesting to coax out. Um, a lot of people, when they make tomato and egg soup, they end up making a tomato soup that they do an egg drop into. This is not that technique. This is a scramble egg that we then add boiling hot broth into so that it bubbles and violently brings together all the fats in the water. First things first, after all of that hullabaloo, we are going to be using chicken stock, <laughs> but um, water works too. Okay, this is what you need. You need two pots. One is going to be filled with about a quart of liquid, either water or stock if you have it lying around. If you're using store-bought stock, just please always try to buy low sodium um, or at least uh, have tasted the broth before you commit to a brand in your household. <sighs> I just think regular um, chicken broth is just so salty and so flavorless and they add things that are a little bit acidic to mess up the flavor so that it can stay longer on the shelf. Not a big fan. Homemade chicken stock, always the best pork bone broth, even fish broth, beef broth, but water also totally fine. If you're vegetarian, just use vegetable broth or water. This is a great vegetarian recipe. Just use water and season it properly with salt, sugar, and MSG. Here are our ingredients. Two tomatoes, three eggs. That's the ratio today. Tomatoes, cut them into wedges. We're cutting them relatively thinly because we wanted to break down the soup quickly. Scallions, onions, allium aromatic basis. No garlic, no ginger required here. If you want to use them, you can. Nice fresh eggs, crack them into a bowl. Chopsticks, whisk them up. Get the yolk and the white well mixed. Cool, no more streaks of white inside. And we have our dough ready, but don't worry too much about it. This gouda will happen later. First, build the flavorful broth. So, what do you want? A Little bit of oil inside of your soup pot. Heat that up, get that smoking hot. Be generous with this oil. We're using neutral oil with a high smoking point. In China, we have good access to the predecessor to canola, which is unfortunately named the rapeseed, which is why they rebranded it as canola after they GMO'd the, out of it. Canola comes from Canada. Um, that's where the can and canola comes from. Okay, we're gonna heat this up, be patient with it, wait for it to come to a boil. While that's happening, make sure that your broth is already at a rolling boil. If it's not a rolling boil, it's not gonna work. The science behind this, it's is that that water is gonna crash into all of that fat and all of that oil. It's gonna bubble like crazy because you're not supposed to put water into oil. And as it bubbles, that movement is going to emulsify our soup. Wait for this to get really, really smoking hot. Oil in your pan is smoking hot. Get your eggs ready and we're going to pour it in. Scramble, scramble, scramble. Before the egg sets, before it dares to set, hot, hot, hot broth is going to go in. See that bubble? That's what you want. That bubbling is gonna bring that fat and that liquid together to create a thicker emulsified scrambled egg soup, so to speak. This is not like a egg drop at all. The little fluffy, light curds of egg. It's delicious and jiggly, but they're going to continue to give flavor to this broth. Just let this come to a boil and let it simmer for two minutes. Look at how tender this is. And keep cooking it. It's a well-cooked egg, but it's gonna keep cooking and give all of that flavor to the broth itself. It's going, this is going to be so much more flavorful than if you were to just egg drop into this. The twist after that, tomatoes go in, scallions go in, Save a little bit for garnish if you like. Bring the whole thing to a boil and let it simmer for about two minutes or until the tomatoes start to break down. If you want to shout out all the other amazing YouTube creators showing what you can do with proper technique, the best example of this is going to be done by a Chinese chef by the name of Wang Gang. 
and he does it cooking on a wok in the countryside. And you can see that after he scrambles his eggs and he adds hot water to the wok, it bubbles and boils and it comes out like almost milky white. That can be done on a commercial wok that is at a very, very high temperature. This is already a huge upgrade, um, even though we're doing it on a Western home stove. But that thickness, that, that little bit of viscosity, that's flavor. This pot of soup here has been going for about two minutes. You can see that the egg is starting to come apart. The tomatoes, more importantly, are starting to come apart, which means that they're starting to leach flavor into the soup itself. And we're building a little bit of texture and cloudiness in the broth itself, which is great. Now let's just season it as simple as it gets, salt, sugar, and MSG. When in doubt, the ratio for, for salt, sugar, MSG is two, one, one. So half its volume in sugar and MSG. So salt here, by the way, kosher salt, not iodized table salt. Two salt, half sugar, half chicken powder, which is my domestic home version of MSG. That's just what I tend to have at home. And just to give it a little bit of spice, a pinch or two of white pepper. Caesar made us another soup at the back. So we can show both of the dough drop techniques, but seasoned and cooked exactly the same. Just swirl it around. Okay, cool. Taste this. Good. 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 It shouldn't taste sweet, it should be balanced. It shouldn't taste like MSG, it should be balanced. Cool, makes sense. Okay, dough drop, easy. We'll do the wet one first and then we'll do the dry one. First things first for the wet dough, is that you'll need a utensil like this, either a slotted spoon or a slotted ladle. Traditionally for Chinese woks, we have these larger uh, sieves for cooking, for deep frying and that sort of thing, which is what it was designed for. Um, but if you have something like this, that'll work. What you're looking for is that the size of the holes is going to determine the size of the dough drop. This is going to make something that's quite small, but it's going to work. For the dry dough, you do not need a utensil like this, which kind of makes it ideal and maybe more applicable for most of you at home. Most important thing is to make sure that your soup is seasoned to your liking before you do this. Second of all, please make sure that your soup is at a rolling boil when you do your wet dough drop. If you drop the dough into lukewarm soup, your dough dumplings won't set properly and you'll end up with a floury broth. That's the last thing you want. So just double check your pancake battery situation. It's maybe a hair thinner than pancake batter, which is kind of what we want. But you're going to pour wet batter into your ladle and then you're going to push it through until they drop down like this. See that? Cool. We'll do it again. Swirl it around, try not to get big dough clumps. But once this hits boiling water, they will set. Stir it around. Give it a second for the dough to form little clumps. Shake it up a little bit. Sometimes they taste a little bit like congee, like little bits of rice that's been inflated. Quite gentle and really delicious. A good way to think about the soup is as we think about congee. One of the main differences between Northern Chinese cooking and Southern Chinese cooking is that Northern Chinese cooking was predominantly based on wheat and other grains, whereas in the South, it's more rice oversimplification. But in the North, this is how we got a thick, nutritious and very fulfilling soup for all seasons. A lot of people think about gudatang as a soup that they eat when they're kids, when they're sick. Very much like how I think about kanji because I grew up in the South as a rice porridge, as something that I ate um, when I was sick. Um, the dry version is going to produce dumpling bits that you have better control over. So this is in a sense for a beginner, also the easier way to make gada because the shape of the dumpling is going to be the shape of the raw dough that you drop in. So if you like a little bit more control, this can work for you. However, it does take a little bit more time because you have to make the dough separately and you can't just drop it directly into the soup. If you've let it sit for a while, just like move it around, toss it a little bit to get rid of some of the excess flour before it goes in. But the same rule, the broth has to be boiling hot before your dough can go in. You're going to get these cute little tadpole-y, dumpling-y, soft, mochi, bite, chew type of situation. Move it around your hands a little bit so that you can get rid of that excess flour and then just scatter it into the soup. Mix that in, let it cook. And add a little bit more. T 
Just let that dough fully hydrate, fully cook, probably about two minutes. For both the wet and the dry dough, you don't want it to cook too long after the dough has been dropped into the broth because they can overcook and become way too gummy. So once that dough's shape has set, you basically want to turn your heat off and just let it rest for about a minute and it's ready to eat. Total cooking time, probably about in two minutes. If you wanted to make this dough ahead of time, you can, but why would you? It takes like a minute, I suppose. And also the broth is like, I mean, this for me is really a five minute meal. The dough made is just mixture of flour and water, no recipe, make sure it kind of like looks right. The thing that takes the longest is bringing the stock to a boil in the first place. If you made me pick, I kind of like the dry dough more because I like uh, a little bit more control. There's less, there's a larger margin of error because I know what shape I'm gonna get before they go in. Um, there's always a chance of over thickening your soup if you're dropping in wet dough into your, into your soup. But that is, in a sense, the more traditional way of doing this. Now let's just plate this up and show you what the final texture is and we'll try some. We are here with Caesar. We just finished our gudatang, and Caesar's gonna help me plate it up, taste it a little bit, see if there is one that he prefers over the other. But here is the first one, the one with the wet dough drop. You helped me prep this, Caesar, but did I explain what gudatang is? Oh, uh, no, you didn't. So this is a dumpling of sorts in the chicken and dumpling type of sense. Just tomatoes, eggs, salt, sugar, MSG. This one here has a wet dough drop, and this one is a dry one but this is very much my childhood um, and what a lot of kids in the North would have, would have eaten. So you wanna garnish this one for me with the scallions and some cilantro and scallions, that sort of aromatics all good over the top just to brighten it up a little bit. And chili oil, uh, not super traditional, but it looks good. So this was, this was the wet one? This is the wet dough, yeah. Just tomatoes and eggs. So poor, so nourishing, right? It's like it's porridge. It's crazy how thick it is. Yeah, it's so much substance. So this was wet, this is dry. Mm -hmm. Very gentle, but so comforting. Do you get dough drop? I think I like that. They're both delicious, but I think I like this one. Yeah? A um, how, what do you think about these little dumpling bits? They're nice. I think uh, this one has a little more texture, mm -hmm. I would say. I would not think it was just egg and oil and, and tomato. The texture that you achieve is pretty wild. Awesome. Kind of reminds me of the chicken and dumplings. Hell yeah. Same type of dumpling, you know, just like a yeah. dough ball type of situation. But it's so, I mean, first and foremost, it's like tomato and egg soup is so, it's just a match made in heaven. All those amino acids talking to each other all those savory notes multiplying doesn't get better than this. This is one of the most popular Chinese combinations of ingredients of all time for good reason. If you like this recipe, the written recipe is in the description box below. If you make this soup, let us know in the comments. And if you are a big fan of tomato and eggs and you are into the nuanced differences between the different types of tomato and egg dishes, we have a tomato and egg drop that is similar to a sauce or a stir fry that's available on Food 52 as well. I'll see you in a couple of weeks.